Hi, welcome back to my art and fiction channel. Today I'm going to be reading you the start of this book, Tamsin, which is, I wrote a few years ago now. And I'll leave a link down below for you to pick up more details if you wish to. So, straight into the reading. The elderly guru was waiting for me on the corner of William Brown Street with his back to St George's Hall. He looked like anybody's grandfather, yet the butterflies in my stomach were performing a full-scale ballet. I had been anticipating this moment for months. Kai walked towards me with the characteristic roll of an old mariner. His fawn sheepskin coat swung open. His trousers and shoes were dark brown, like his old-fashioned trilby. He paused in his stride. Our eyes locked. I gazed into his smiling, fleshy face and the entire city seemed to fall silent. People still moved around us, of course, but they might as well have been phantoms. Miss Ashbrook? Tamsin Ashbrook? An unexpected kiss was quickly pressed between my eyebrows. I stepped back a pace, disliking his presumption. Some people are more touchy-feely than others, I'm not that way. Give me my personal space any day. I smiled tightly and nodded. That's me. Hello, Tamsin. Kai's shining blue eyes were friendly yet also shrewd and he stepped to one side. I glanced at the indifferent faces of a group of students who ambled by. They were oblivious of my nervous expectations of this meeting. Yes, yet isn't this the usual way of things? One person's life is changed forever, is wrenched from its established path for good or ill, while for everyone else it's just business as usual. Kai waved one hand towards a pedestrian crossing outside Lime Street Station. Shall we? As we began walking, I asked, where are we going? To the temple, he said, his eyes on the snarling push of growling traffic. His voice was unusually musical, and his regional accent more Cheshire than Liverpool. And where is this temple? I tensed involuntarily. There were some kinds of mysteries I could do without, and going to an unknown location with a man I barely knew was one of them. Even though we had been exchanging letters for some months, I remained cautious. For all I knew, Kai could turn out to be just another charlatan, and every word of his a lie. That he looked benign meant nothing. Certainly he seemed a lot stronger than me, despite his advanced age. His melodic voice was empty of all threat as he replied, The temple is at the address which you're familiar with. I had left this address scrawled in big green letters on a sheet of A4 cartridge paper beside my new computer. If I vanished from the face of this earth, the police would have a starting point for their search. Not that this would make me any less dead. I'd been raised with a family rule of always telling someone where I was going. I wasn't able to do this any more, so I told it to pieces of paper instead. Some habits can take much longer to die than people. Kai led me into the echoing clamour of Lime Street Station and down the groaning escalators to the Mersey Rail Underground. Three people pushed ahead of us, risking life and limb in fervent submission to private timetables. Harsh yellow lights glared above regimented rows of perspex shielded adverts for products which didn't interest me. To ward off the autumnal chill, I had worn my flowing black velvet coat, which had a long thin collar adorned with a purple silk bobby. My black boots added height to my five foot five inches. My long curly chestnut hair was held back from my face by a small black velvet bow. Kai is an unusual name, I said, as we approached the ticket kiosk. Yes, I expect so. He seemed privately amused. In Old English, it means something like keeper of the keys. Do you use an assumed name? It's to protect my privacy and the privacy of my family, said Kai. I'm married, you know. I wondered what Kai's real name might be, 
The secrecy seemed excessive and did nothing to ease my doubts about this man who claimed to be able to share spiritual knowledge. So far, my pursuit of real, honest, practical information had led me only to liars, fanatics and mystical basket, basket cases. I thoroughly expected Kai to turn out to be just another of these. Kai approached a kiosk. Two tickets for Hunt's Cross, please. I reached for my purse. No, no, allow me. Kai swiftly withdrew his wrinkled brown leather wallet. Thanks, but I'd much rather pay for myself. Kai's baby blue eyes widened. Please, let me pay for you. My treat. He shook his head slightly and chuckled. You shouldn't be so independent. I frowned. I've had to learn how to be. My voice sounded brittle even to me. I was extremely proud of my independence. It had served me well. It was a family trait which I was not willing to compromise. Undeterred. Kai scooped up our tickets and changed in one large hand, then guided me through the turnstile and towards a platform for trains to Liverpool Central. In your letters, you told me something of your life. You lost your family. A car accident, wasn't it? I nodded. It wasn't something I could easily talk about. Life had been tough going in the three years since their deaths. Yet it had been these same hardships which had brought me to this meeting. Conventional religions had offered me nothing but a series of rules, polished phrases and childish stories. In meeting Kai, I hoped, vainly perhaps, to find someone who genuinely knew the purpose of this beautiful and barbaric experience which we so glibly call life. Debris from junk food swirled along the black rubber floor. A one-footed pigeon pecked at a smear of fried rice. Nearby, a young girl with pallid skin whined at three fretful, squabbling toddlers. She didn't seem much older than me, but she looked worn out already. The children ignored her completely. The loss must be hard for one as young as you, said Kai. <coughs> I'm 19, I said, a touch defensively. So young, he smiled, but at that age I was on my own too. Sailed the world in the Merchant Navy was torpedoed three times in the war, saw many things, learned much about life. Is that how you became a spiritual teacher? Kai laughed. No. My family apprenticed me to a tailor, a trade that's in the family. I completed only one day. I knew it wasn't the life for me, so I enrolled in the Merchant Navy on the way home. My mother was upset, not because I'd gone against my parents' wishes, but because she knew I'd be away for so long. But I'd been in the church all my life, you know. My whole family is this way. And through the church I met a gentleman who very kindly gave me his time. But understand this. A pupil has to do all the necessary work themselves. A teacher can't do the work for you. What does a teacher do then? I wanted to ask Kai more about his own teacher, but he was already moving the conversation on. His mention of the church was disconcerting too, as Christianity had always felt alien to me. A real master knows what is necessary for each pupil, knows how to achieve the required development. Reading books or talking won't give any person any spiritual advancement. If that was so, every university would be peopled by saints. A cold rush of hard air buffeted my face. I turned to its source, the dark tunnel entrance which gaped like a cobra's throat, lashed by its yellow sliding tongue. That'll be our train coming now, observed Kai. I smiled wryly. I could have met you at Hunt's Cross train station rather than retrace my, trace my routes back through St Michael's, which is the nearest station to my home. I know, said Kai, but I thought this might give us a chance to talk. Between a pupil and a teacher, there can be no secrets. What kind of secrets was he expecting me to divulge? I really didn't have any. Besides, I value my privacy, and my precious spare time come to mention it. I swallowed the whisper of resentment over the pointlessly drawn-out journey. The train sighed loudly as it braked. 
prospective passengers surged forwards, surrounding the doors even before they slid open. Anyone disembarking had to elbow a route through the stony-faced crowd. Kai and I hung back, letting the impatient stampede settle down before we stepped into the carriage. There were plenty of vacant seats. We sat opposite each other. Kai gazed calmly out of the grime-encrusted windows, a contented expression on his large square face. As the train moved away from the station, I said, So, what was it that you wanted to talk about? I have so many questions about your philosophy, but I don't know where to begin. He nodded understandingly. Making a start is often the hardest part. Then he asked, Do you have a boyfriend? I wondered what possible business that might be of his, but in replied in honesty, no. Have you had boyfriends in the past? Are you a virgin? My eyebrows lifted slightly and I felt heat colour my face. Yes, I've had boyfriends, no one's serious, and I'll stay a virgin until it suits me to do otherwise, until I meet someone worthwhile. A husband? Not necessarily. My voice carried my dislike of his inquiry. How about someone whose eyes don't register money signs when they learn I own my own house? Someone who doesn't assume I can't look after myself or that because I'm on my own in this world I'll fall fall headlong for the first moron who smiles sweetly. I'm nobody's fool, Kai. And if you're expecting expecting me to have sex with you in return for your great wisdom, forget it. Despite my crisp toe, my answer seemed to please him. Kai smiled reassuringly. I would never hurt a hair on your head, Tamsin. I have two daughters of my own and two sons. You're absolutely right that few people can be trusted and disease is rife and increasingly so. I meant only to try and understand a little more about you. To progress in the teachings, a person needs immense self-discipline. If a person is casual with themselves or has no order in their life, then very little progress is possible. He folded his hands loosely in his lap, leaving me to ponder on the origins of his stilted speech. His long fingers were unusually tapered. On his right middle finger he wore a chunky ring designed with one silver and two gold entwining snakes. He saw me looking at the ring and explained three were made for use in the temple by commission. I smiled at a polite response. I did not want to say that the ring looked like he'd been made by an amateur, so I said nothing at all. He seemed to assume I was been favourably impressed. He beamed broadly as a train roared out of the dark tunnel and into Central Station. Did I mention that I don't like confined spaces, especially dark ones? Being trapped underwater in a sinking car can have that lasting effect. Kai and I arrived outside a typical Edwardian terrace house on a drab street where bellowing boys kicked a greying football around low-income bracket cars. Kai's knock on the varnished wooden door was answered by a strikingly beautiful girl only a little older than me. A red paisley scarf failed her hair and flowed over one shoulder. Her smile flashed perfect teeth. Hi, I'm Corrine, she said. One arm, one wave of her arm inviting me to enter the narrow, smell, stale-smelling hall, which was partially blocked by a stack of cardboard boxes. Pleased to meet you, I replied, as she directed me into the front room, leaving Kai behind me in the hall. I'm Tamsin, Tamsin Ashbrook. I extended my right hand in greeting, but she brushed by me to claim possession of a badly fraying armchair. I lowered my hand, feeling slightly stung. A rush of first impressions struck me. Kai's pupils seemed to be predominantly middle-aged, if not elderly. A bare light bulb hung from the ceiling. The walls were papered in greying wood chip. Beige curtains draped the windows, which were veiled by dense white nets. The oblong fish tank was in urgent need of cleaning. A Victorian bureau with a leprous mirror swallowed up one wall almost entirely. The scruffy chairs were from three different suites. The chocolate-coloured carpet needed vacuuming. 
These people's interests may have been predominantly spiritual, but how did this prevent them from cleaning their meeting house? A short, blonde lady named Patricia asked Corrine about her stitches. In her plummy accent, Corrine replied that she'd had them removed that morning. Corrine re- smiled coyly at me, fluttering her mascara clogged lashes as she explained, I haven't been able to wash my hair for weeks, hence this scarf. That'll teach you not to get blind drunk then, won't it? snapped an elderly lady who wore large fake pearls and a short sleeve pink jumper. Corrine ignored her completely. I lingered in the doorway, wondering if I should help myself to a seat. I decided to allow them to be the rude ones. I would wait until I was advi- invited. Kai entered the room by stepping around me. Now, now, Beatrice, he chided indulgently as if to a petulant child. Beatrice's large dark eyes glittered with anger. Two spots of pink fury flushed her round cheeks. You don't sympathise with her, do you? She folded her plump arms aggressively over her pink jumper. If she hadn't drunk herself into a stupor, she wouldn't have fallen and split her head open. Sympathy? She doesn't deserve sympathy. Corrine inspected the hem of her short black skirt and brushed away imaginary dust. Her blouse had a huge floppy bow. The style was much too old for her. She seemed to pretend that Beatrice simply wasn't there a feat which was made easier by Beatrice's huffy exit from the room. Kai stiffly lowered himself into an aged grey armchair. A sky-blue satin tie was knotted tightly at his white cotton collar. He should have worn a bigger neck size. A hand-knitted royal blue jumper sagged around his broad hips. The brown trousers had seen younger days. There were stains on the knees and a snag in the synthetic fibre. Kai smiled up at me from his chair. Do hang your coat up and make yourself a home. Everyone, this is Tamsin. His followers reacted as if they had only just noticed me. A volley of polite smiles and curiosity obediently came my way. I smiled tightly to hide my unexpected self-consciousness and returned to the stale hall. There was no space left on the long row of old-fashioned metal coat hooks, so I just draped my coat over Kai's. On re-entering the cramped front room, I felt every eye evaluate my calf-length black dress. It had a sweetheart neckline, a tight bodice and flowing cuffs and skirts. Around my neck hung a large silver ankh. I pretended not to notice several withering glances exchanged between people. I liked my outfit. If they didn't, then that was their problem. A tall, slightly stooped elderly man tapped my hand with his inch-long fingernails. Hello, I'm Sam. There's a space next to me if you'd like to sit down. A thin, white ponytail trailed over the grubby collar of Sam's old twill jacket. Traces of dog hairs clung to his baggy corduroy trousers. Thank you, I said. Peering over his half-moon glasses, he asked me, Have you read anything by Gurdjieff? He thought we're all asleep, you know. Moving around like automatons, asleep to reality. Sam had a high, querulous voice with the only faintest trace of a Liverpool accent, as if he had tried to school himself out of it. An elderly Canadian woman resolutely declared, We are asleep to our real selves. Until you awake and really know yourself, you can evolve no further. Her grey-blue eyes were obscured behind strong bifocal glasses. She had a broad face with prominent cheekbones. A bright red ribbon held her iron-grey hair in a tight bun. She wore a thick red woolen jumper with a blue nylon body warmer, a heavy tweed skirt and ribbed woolen tights. Men's work boots made her feet seem enormous. Hi, I'm Lily, by the way. Lily was darning the heel of a pair of ugly grey woolen tights. I'd never seen anyone bother to mend tights before, and how peculiar to have brought along needlework repairs anyway. I glanced at her sturdy boots and tried to hide my bewilderment. Corrine abruptly sprang to her feet and strode through the doorway just as Beatrice approached from the hall, carrying a tea of tray. Carrying a tray of tea, even. 
The whole lot flew in the air and crashed to the floor. Flaming hell, Corrine, now look what you've done. Corrine quietly said, you were standing right behind the door. Of course I was. How else can I walk through it? Pick these cups up. Corrine immediately knelt before Beatrice's feet to collect the broken shards. The elderly woman flounced past her, deliberately flicking the hem of her skirt in Corrine's face. Corrine flushed but said, It was just an accident, Corrine, Beatrice, and as much your fault as mine. Accident? Accident? You're always having accidents. I watched this spectacle carefully, aware of the instant tension in the room. Corrine slowly gathered up the broken cups and did nothing to defend herself. Kai made no attempt to intervene. It seemed a peculiar way for supposedly spiritual people to behave, and frankly, I felt embarrassed. Lily watched me watching Corrine, then chided, Help her, dear! I wondered why Lily did nothing to help Corrine herself, especially as Lily was sitting much closer to Corrine than I. Besides, I was a guest. No one said anything to countermand Lily's request, so... Despite the glaring discourtesy shown to me, I helped Corrine pick up the surviving mugs and ceramic splinters, then followed her into the hall and through to the rear room. At least I had unintentionally been given a chance to get a quick look around the other ground floor rooms. If I had been disappointed by the shabby front room of Kai's meeting house, then the small rear room was a real shock. It was crammed with couches and armchairs in advanced stages of decay. In one corner was a huge pile of dog-eared books. In another corner was a stack of old furniture reaching almost to the ceiling. The curtains had come partly unhooked. One couch was buried under rolled-up carpets. A badly stained 1970s coffee table hogged almost all the remaining floor space. To pass into the kitchen which extended off from this room, I had to squeeze sideways between two fraying armchairs. I could hardly believe my own eyes. The kitchen was no better. On the floor were numerous cardboard boxes heaped with rusting tins of food and bundles of yellowing newspaper. A trail of soil leading from the yard door was trampled into the carpet. A sticky flypaper catcher dangled limply from the dusty fluorescent strip light, its length dotted with decaying insects. Dining chairs were precariously heaped against one wall, with rolled up rugs thrown on top. This disgusting mess was a far cry from the serene spiritual sanctuary which I had imagined. I could not understand why Kai and his pupils tolerated this squalor. So, that's the opening section of Tamsin. And it's that's the start of the Artisan Sorcery series. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Leave me some comments. And in the corner over there is a little subscribe button. And that will help you make sure you don't miss any future videos that come out once a week. Generally at Thursday, aiming for 10 o'clock in the morning. So, see you soon. Bye. (laughs)